Okay, hello. Uh, no one is here yet, but we'll start. Um, first, I'm going to go. Oh, one person is here. All right. Um, so, first, I'm just going to go briefly over the final assignment. Um, well, okay, okay, so first of all, there's two options for the final assignment, as it says on the syllabus. Um, one is the final exam, which is I'm showing the instructions for here. Um, it's more or less just like each of the midterms, only twice as big, so you answer two questions instead of one question in two to three pages each. Um, and uh, there's seven questions, each key to part of the reading. So you ch can choose two of them. And um, other than that, I think the instructions are identical. Um, the other option, for the um, final assignment. So what it says in the syllabus is, students who receive an A minus or higher on the first two exams. Now, I haven't got the second exam back, so uh, <laughs> I don't know whether you got an A minus on the second exam, but um, students who receive an A minus or higher on the first two exams may choose to write a final paper, approximately eight to 10 pages in place of the final on a topic to be discussed in advance with me. So, um, I mean, as I think I said during my uh, the first class, the reason it says, you know, students who receive an A minus or higher, it's, uh, um, you know, it's mostly just to let you know that this is supposed to be a harder option than the take home final, not an easier option. Um, uh, nevertheless, you know, um, if you uh, want to do this, especially if you already have an idea how you would do it, but if you don't, you can talk to me. Um, uh, I certainly would encourage, especially anyone who's thinking of going on to graduate school in philosophy to uh, give this a try. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's obviously, harder to come up with your own topic. Pretty hard after 10 weeks to come up with your own topic about Kant and write about that, um, rather than just answering my questions. Um, so, um, if, uh, Yes, if you're seeing this lecture, unless you're Decker, you're seeing it on YouTube, but um, in any case, uh, if you're interested in this, let me know right away. Um, there's no like formal assignment for the paper option, um, but uh, if you want me to suggest topics, we can talk about it. Okay. Um, with that, I'm gonna go back to talking about Kant. Okay. So, um, there we are in the book, getting almost to the end of our list here, that is to the end of the Doctrine of Elements. And the transcendental dialectic, which is the second part of the transcendental logic. Um, there's concepts of pure reason. Dialectical instances of pure reason, uh, you know, instances. And um,
just like three types of geography the antinomy and the idea. So the antinomy actually, uh, this part uh, is uh, pretty long. It has nine sections. Um, the All the reading is from the first two and from the ninth. So um, the first one is the system of cosmological ideas. Right, where he goes basically goes to the table of categories and says which four categories are going to give rise to antinomies when reason tries to use them um, to represent them unconditioned in the world of experience. Um, and I was arguing last time that those four category, categories are basically the in my version of the table of categories, the second column categories, the categories of externality or self difference. Um, and then section two contains the actual antinomies. Right? So from that, there's four antinomies. And from that, we read the third antinomy, which is the antinomy of cause and effect. Then there's six other sections, and uh, which we're not reading. Um, and then there's section nine. So technically, the title of section nine is the empirical employment of the regulative principle of reason in respect of all cosmological ideas. Um, so the regulative employment of the idea of reason or the, um, sorry, empirical employment of the regulative principle of reason means he's like talking here about how uh, the cosmological ideas can actually be legitimately used not as representations of objects, but as like directions to the understanding to, um, um, to never stop with any uh, object in the series of experience, but to always seek for its condition in four different ways. So, right, to, so to always look for what comes before it in time and outside of space, to always uh, like look into its subdivisions. Um, and so the third antinomy, which is what we're talking about, to always look for its cause. Um, the fourth antinomy um, is about contingence and necessity. It's actually a little hard to understand the difference between that and cause and effect. I'm not going to try to explain it now. Anyway, um, so uh, so that's what the empirical employment of the regulative idea is. Um, but in fact, uh, um, In this section, there are uh, four main subsections, and each one of them is titled uh, Solution of the Cosmological Idea of X. So, um, I mean, these solutions do partly involve talking about the legitimate use of the cosmological ideas in empirical cognition. Um, but uh, they also talk about a lot of other things. In particular, the solution to the third antinomy is mostly about the possibility of freedom, um, which is not really an empirical employment of the regulative idea. So, um, so, you know, it might be better to think of this section as solutions of the antinomy. That's definitely what it contains, or a lot of what it contains. Um, right, and the assigned reading for today was the, um, um, so again, there's four antinomies, each corresponding to one of the 
goes in my version of the table of categories. That is the headings of the categories, quantity, quality, relation, and modality. Um, uh, So, um, oh, right, I know what I was going to say. Right? So these are the mathematical categories. And these are the dynamical categories. So after Kant finishes these two solutions, there's a note, a concluding note to the mathematics, the solutions of the mathematical inquiries, an introduction to the solution of the dynamical inquiries. So the reading, the assigned reading for today begins with that note, which explains basically how the dynamical antinomies are going to be different from the mathematical antinomies. Um, and then the rest of it was this part, that is the solution of the third antinomy. The solution of the antinomy of cause and effect. Now, um, so, I mean, I am going to come back and talk about the things we talked about in this note. Um, but first, um, what does Kant mean by a solution of an antinomy? So the solution certainly, what it certainly doesn't mean is saying which side of the antinomy is right, right? Each antinomy has a thesis and an antithesis. The arguments oppose each other. Um, each one tries to prove its case by contradiction. That is by proving that the opposite assumption is absurd, right? So in the third antinomy in particular, the, the thesis side tries to prove that if um, you assume that uh, there is only natural causation and um, no uh, free causation, that you get a contradiction. Whereas the antithesis tries to show that uh, the idea of free causation involves a contradiction, right? So, uh, so, uh, um, which side does Kant think is right? Neither, right? Kant thinks both of these arguments are due to the transcendental illusion. They're, you know, they both look like good arguments due to the transcendental illusion, um, but uh, um, neither of them is a good argument. Um, um, I mean, what they do succeed in showing, what each, which the two sides together succeed in showing is that the assumption that the transcendental illusion is trying to get us to make, namely that there's an unconditioned absolute external explanation of some events um, in the course of experience, that that assumption is self-contradictory. So, um, um, so therefore solving the antinomy is not gonna be uh, deciding which side is right. Um, so rather, to put it roughly, um, the solution the antinomy is going to be to show the flaw in each side. And it should, in some sense, be the same flaw in both sides. Right? Because even though uh, in the case of the antinomies, the, you know, the conclusions divide into these two contradictory opposites, 
um, it's still really just one error. It's still really just one error that Dream is making in the entire dialectic. Um, and uh, um, and it's one sub version of that error that reason is making or is causing the understanding to make in the antinomy. And the error is um, to look for an unconditioned ground somewhere in the series of um, empirical events, empirical objects. So uh, that's the mistake. Both sides are making that mistake. Um, um, so the solution is going to consist in pointing out that, that, that that's the mistake, right? So um, the reason it's related to that other thing about the empirical employment of the regulative idea is that once you understand that that's the mistake, you see that the, this demand was always, was never directed at the object at all. It was, it's a subjective need of reason to find uh, explanations for the judgments that the understanding arrives at. And um, therefore it results in a directive to the understanding to look for those explanations, not in some conclusion about the object, right? So, um, so that's basically what the solution is supposed to be. However, the difference, and this is part of what I'm talking about in this note, is the difference between the way that works in the case of the mathematical infinity versus the way it works in the dynamical infinities. So, um, So basically, in the case of the mathematical antinomies, the solution results in saying that um, both sides were asking a bad question. Right? So, like the antinomy of quantity um, or antinomy of plurality of experience, as you might put it. Uh, is um, uh, is asking what is the number of the series of experiences? Um, of course, like what is the number? Well, it depends on what you do, right? Here, like, but and and. and um, but we don't really care, it doesn't matter what you choose, we don't really care whether the number is a hundred or a million or whatever, we care whether it's finite or infinite, <laughs> right? So, the, so we're asking, is the number of experiences finite or infinite? That is, can you use some measure to, so in the case of the time version, can you use some measure to measure back the series of experiences that led up to this one and um uh arrive at that number or you know is it that no matter what measure you choose and no matter how many times you repeat it you'll never arrive at that end of it Um, well, actually, I put that a little bit wrong. Or is the total quantity of experience such that it can't be measured, you can't finish measuring it no matter what measure you do? Right? So the first case is saying that the number or quantity of experience is finite. Um, whereas the other case is saying the quantity of experience is infinite. And um, the solution is going to be to say uh, that's a bad question. There is no number. 
there is no completed quantity of experience. Um, it's not given as a totality. And uh, um, so it's only given as a plurality, as a series, in this, in this version of it, going back in time. And um, um, we never get to a last member of this series. So it isn't a finite number, but we have no givenness of the whole thing either. So it isn't an infinite number. It's just uh, not a number, right? So like both sides were, were wrong. As Kant says, this is on B, bottom of B557. Um, and it's page 462 in the translation. This, so this is from the, that transitional note, right? So he says, this suit in our previous trial of it has been dismissed as resting on both sides on false presuppositions. Right, so when the two sides came before the judge and got the judge to give these contradictory verdicts, um, the um, uh, they were both resting their case on a false hypothesis. The false hypothesis being that there is some total quantity of past experience or of the world in space. And the judge said, you're both resting your case on a false hypothesis, therefore the suit is dismissed. <laughs> um, but as Kant goes on in that same place, but since in the dynamical antinomy, a presupposition compatible with the pretensions of reason may perhaps be found, and since the judge may perhaps make good what is lacking in the pleas which both sides have been guilty of misstating, the suit may be settled to the satisfaction of both parties. Procedure impossible in the case of the mathematical antinomies. Right, so in these two cases, things are different. Not saying why yet, but in these two cases, things are different. And um, the judge is going to say, look, you guys have both misstated your case. Um, let me restate your case for you properly. And then you'll see that your claims actually don't conflict. And you're, so you're both right. So how's that supposed to work out? Well, in the case of the third antinomy in particular, the answer is gonna be, um, so now this was the, this picture was the first antinomy. Now I'm drawing the picture of the third antinomy. Now remember, the, like the picture for the third antinomy, even though we're talking about the same series of experience, experiences, we have to draw a much more complicated picture of it because it's like, um, here's the series of events. But the series of events is caused, and it's caused by substances. Phenomenal substances. Just bear me on. All right. Um, right, and remember the example I used in that last time, although that example raises some questions, is the way those boats going down the stream in the second analogy, um, the event is, and as I was saying last time also, in real life, events are always continuous changes. Um, 
So the ongoing attempt is the acceleration of the boats towards the center of the Earth, and the cause is the Earth. Right, so that's in general the way causes and effects are according to Kant. So um, when there's an event here, call it B. So, I mean, first of all, an event is a change from one state to another. Substances are permanent. So that is like quasi-substance, there is no change. The event is always a change of some substance from one state to another, right? So call this substance A, and the change here is from, let's see, actually Kant thinks of it like this. The change is from not B to B, right? Like, of course, it wasn't just not B. It had some definite state at this time, but what we're interested here is the fact that it wasn't B before this, and afterwards it was B. So, um, right, so B is like a state of substance A. So what was the cause of that? Well, the cause is some other substance called C. C is the cause of this event. But again, C is permanent. There's always been C. Um, so why didn't this event happen sooner? Well, uh, in order to, to do this, C has to be in a certain state, called state B. So um, before C was in state D, it, um, although it still had the, it was still the same substance, it didn't yet have the ability to cause this change in A. So this state B is what Kant calls the causality of C. So there was some event in which C changed from not B to B. And um, um, it was only after that change that C was able to change, cause this change of A from not B to B. And so there must have been some other substance called E, which caused this change. And of course, it had to do that by first changing to some state, which is the causality of E that allowed it to cause B, and so on and so forth. Right? So, like, so the, the series is a little bit complicated. <laughs> um, this is the series we're talking about. Now, if you ask how much time is there between B, between this event and this event, I mean, in real life, there is no time between them. Or that is, again, in real life, changes are continuous. So it's like C was, was in the process of, of changing, and once it reached a certain point, it started causing A to change. So, I mean, but I, I can't really draw that on the board. Uh, um, although, in the second analogy, he does discuss that in detail. Uh, most of the time, he talks as if this simpler picture makes sense. So it's like first, E changes to F. That causes C to change to B. That causes A to change to B, and so forth. Um, So the solution to the third antinomy is going to be to say, well, the antithesis is right. There can't be a free cause in the world of experience. What would a free cause in the world of experience look like? Well, suppose E just by itself changed to F. There was nothing that made that happen. That would be a free cause in this in the in the world of experience. Um, and uh, well, we know the antithesis is 
sorry, we, we know the yeah, we know the antithesis is right that there can't be such a thing because that was the conclusion of the second analogy. Right? The, the second analogy concluded that every event has a cause. So this kind of thing that is not determined by anything that happened before it is not possible. It's not a possible object of experience. So anytime we see a change, we know we may not know what the cause is, but we know it had a cause and we can look. Um, so the antithesis was right about it. However, the antithesis is wrong to say that a free cause is impossible. And the thesis is right to say that a free cause is possible. Um, why is the thesis right to say that? Well, I mean, that is in a certain sense of possible anyway. So like part of the way the judge is gonna restate the claim of the thesis is to scale the claim way back. That, you know, the, the thesis said that there must be free causation. Otherwise, uh, um, there could be no complete explanation of any event. Um, the judge in restating the claim of the thesis is going to change that to a free cause is logically possible. <laughs> that is, the idea of a free cause um, involves no absurdity. So that's a significantly weaker claim, but give but um, the, the judge thinks that that's what the thesis is really after, um, for reasons I'll try to describe later. So um, what is the what is the claim the thesis is going to make? Um, so like. Okay. And let me first draw it one way and then say why that's not sufficient. So, like, the way the thesis can also be right is to say that this event has a free cause, but its free cause is not part of the world of experience. So it's like a let's see. It's a super sensible subject. Um And the reason the thesis is going to be right is although, that although it's true that every event has to be the effect of some empirical substance acting at a certain time through its causality, which already happened at an early which already happened before that. So, you know, uh, although it's true that every event has to have a cause like that, it's not impossible that it also has um, a free, super sensible cause. And again, when we say it's not impossible here, we mean it's not logically impossible. That is, there's no contradiction in thinking that. Um, in another sense of possible, um, this is on B586. on page 479 in the translation. It has not even been our inten intention to prove the possibility of freedom. 
For in this also we should not have succeeded since we cannot from mere concepts a priori know the possibility of any real ground and its causality. That's, that's coming from like the very end of the solution of the third infinity. After Kant is summarizing what he's done, he says, but by the way, um, don't get confused. Don't, first of all, don't think I proved, as you might think, because he's saying the thesis and the antithesis are both right. Don't think I proved that there is a free cause. And don't even think I proved that a free cause is possible. Because remember, possibility is one of the categories, right? It's it's the first moment of the category of modality, or the first category under the heading of modality. So, like, we only know how to apply it to objects of experience, and the um, um, first postulate of empirical thought in general. Remember from like the end of the system of principles tells us how we can apply the, the how we must be able to apply the concept of possibility to experiences. What is possible is what accords with the form of experience in with respect to intuition and concepts or something like that. Right. So that's the only way we know how to make sense of the concept of possibility. So it, like, if you talk about this object that's not an object of experience, and you ask me, is it possible? Um, I can't say either yes or no, because I don't know how to apply the concept of possibility. Right? So all I can say is, the most I can say is, well, it's not impossible. It's the concept of it doesn't make it impossible. <laughs> Right? That is, um, the concept of it doesn't contradict itself. If the concept of it contradicted itself, then, um, right, then it would be formally impossible. It would be impossible as a valid subjective state of my intellect. And I wouldn't have to ask how it applies to an object to, to rule out the possibility of the object. But, like, on the other hand, if if there's no contradiction in it, I still don't know how it can possibly apply to an object. I still don't know what possible even means in the case of such an object. And so I can't really be said to have shown that a free cause is possible. So you can say, like, what Kant has shown here is that a free cause meets the minimum requirement for possibility. And in a case like this, that's the most we can say. However, uh, there's one other thing I want to say about this before we go on, which is, and this is as I said, as I promised, this picture is a little bit misleading. I mean, um, what the judge gets the thesis to say is not so far off from what it said originally. So, like, for example, you know, suppose I wanted to say, well, One supersensible object can be a free cause of another supersensible object. Right? So, like, what this means is some object of an intuitive intellect, and I don't even know that an intuitive intellect is possible, could uh, be such as to require that if it exists, then this other one exists. So, I mean, there, are, I think there's kind of obviously no logical impossibility. But this logical possibility is completely empty, right? But I'm saying that it's not logically impossible that some unknowable objects in some unknowable way cause some other unknowable objects. That's not very interesting. Um, so, um, what we have here is, well, so first of all, in this, even in this picture, I've gotten closer to it by saying this object itself is super, super sensible, but this, its effect is this event, right? So it has a sensible effect. 
But actually, Todd goes farther than that here and says it tries to prove that a substance, a phenomenal substance, can also, regarded in some other respect, be a supersensible substance. And in that other respect, it can be a free cause of the same thing that it's a. It's the opposite of a free cause, a, like a necessary cause, a natural cause. In this case, it's. Um, in its aspect of phenomenal substance, it's the natural or necessary cause of some, or actually it's this event, I'm sorry, right? It's the natural or necessary cause of this event. But in its other aspect, as super sensible, but like I don't know how to draw this, but the point is that E is both uh, a phenomenal substance and regarded from another point of view, a super sensible substance. And when it's regarded from the other point of view, it's a free cause of this same effect. So, like, okay, this is getting too complicated. I can't really draw it in that picture. But um, just to remind you what a phenomenon is and what a noumenon is, to, to show why this is like not obviously absurd anyway, a phenomenon is um, the object of a discursive inference. So, like, Here's the discursive intellect. Here's its empirical concept. Here's the, the empirical intuition. So it's like a manifold. Right? Here's the empirical intuition in between the imaginations of something. And here's the object. So when we call it a phenomenon, we're giving it a, like we're referring to it relative to this type of faculty that gives us the object. But suppose over here there's an intuitive intellect. Well, how does an intuitive intellect represent an object? We don't know, except that by definition, it doesn't have this division into concept and intuition, right? Its representation is both intellectual and intuitive. It's an intuitive intellect or an intellectual intuition. Um, but how is that possible? We don't know. We don't know anything about it. We don't know if it's possible. But um, um, we can abstract from the what we know about our intellect, that it requires sensible intuition. Um, and just like think of an intellect having an object without that, and there's no contradiction in that. So there's no contradiction in the idea of an intuitive intellect. And um, I don't know how to draw this either, but again, when I call this an object of discursive intellection, that is a phenomenon. I'm thinking of it as I'm, I'm calling it the end of this hour, basically. Whatever's at the end of this hour. The object of an intuitive intellect is called a numenon. That means that means whatever's at the end of this hour. There's no contradiction in supposing that what's at the end of this hour is also at the end of that. There's no contradiction, but that's the most you can say about it. I mean, because remember from the amphiboly, we only know how to use the concepts of identity and difference with respect to objects in space, which are phenomena, right? So even when I say what's at the end of this arrow is the same as the what's at the end of that arrow, 
I'm already using that concept of identity or sameness um, beyond the range where I have any idea how to apply it. So I, um, the most I can say is, well, if I just look at the concept of sameness without asking how or whether I can apply it, and I just look at the, the concepts of intuitive and discursive intellection. I don't see any contradiction in saying the same is the object of one and the object of another. So there's no contradiction in saying that this substance which as a phenomenon is a permanent, um, an object that's permanent in time, that is a phenomenal substance. So it's the same here and here and here and here and here. There's no contradiction in saying, but by the way, that same thing is also the object, is also a noumenon. Now, when I say it's a noumenon, like time and space are the form of Right, so this is these are empirical. This is an empirical concept, and this is empirical intuition. But the form of empirical intuition is time and space, and the form of uh, discursive concepts is the is the is the categories. Right, so like um, things that happen in time are things that happen to phenomena. Right, time is part of the form of empirical intuition. When I regard it as a human um, I'm regarding it not as existing at any time. Not as permanent throughout time, not as not as in time at all. Right? This this intellect doesn't have a form of sensible intuition, because it doesn't have sensible intuition, it has intellectual intuition. Um, so in particular, its objects don't appear to it in time. Well, I mean, its objects don't appear to it. <laughs> it, it, it makes its objects, but in any case, its objects are not in time. Um, so, uh, Okay, so so far this sounds like not very much is being given to the thesis. Right? I mean, we said they were we were gonna show that they're both right. But I mean the antithesis the antithesis was right to say that um um, no object of experience as such can be a free cause. Right now we have to add as such. That's basically the restatement of the antithesis claim. We have to add as such because the antithesis can't rule out. So this is as, as object of experience, it can't be a free cause because the categories must be applied to it. And by the second analogy, that means that every event in it must have a so, um, but the antithesis can't rule out that regarded in a different way, it is a free cause. Um, so, like, that's a pretty small change, right? Because, like, all the antithesis has to say is, oh, yeah, it's logically possible that there's some other way of looking at this thing in which it, it, in which it's a free cause. But that has no effect. As Kant emphasizes over and over, this solution is going to have no effect on the use of the principle of causality in um, theoretical cognition. That is, I mean, in either in everyday life or in science, right? So, I mean, it's still always going to be true that whatever happens, you can find a cause that determines that to happen. There can't be any exceptions to that. So, I mean, 
that seems like it's pretty much what the antithesis wants. Whereas on the other hand, what we're getting the thesis is just this bare logical possibility. Oh yeah, well maybe there could be a, maybe some of these objects experience are also looked at from a different point of view, three positive events. But that different point of view is this different point of view. And we don't know that this different point of view is even positive. So that doesn't seem like we're giving the thesis very much. So, I mean, to understand what's going on here, we have to realize that, that I think more clearly than the paralogy of them, in a way it's already true in the paralogy, but more clearly than in the paralogy Kant is already like is explicitly building the basis for practice, his practical philosophy here. So, like what we mean from a practical point of view, and remember, practical here more or less equals ethical. So what we need from a practical point of view is, um, roughly speaking, um, we need. I need to know that um, I'm free to act uh, even against my private interests. So, um, right, and therefore it's not absurd for me to have a duty to act against my private interest. Um, But there are two parts. So, well, I mean, it's not explain the way I think so. So, there are two parts here that you have to pay attention to. I have to be free to act. What does that mean? Well, it means I have to be free to cause sensible appearances. Right, like, I mean, if you tell me that I'm somehow free to cause like super sensible objects to exist or do whatever they do, <laughs> um, right, like, remember, when I say do whatever they do, they don't change from one state to another in time. So, uh, but, like, we don't really understand what kind of in what way they can do or be or have states or whatever. But anyway, like if you tell me um, I have the ability to do this, that's not relevant to ethics. Ethics is about acting in the world. Right? So this is a sensible effect. And then on the other hand, this, right? Like, what does it mean that I have a, my own private interest? Like, what makes that possible? So, I mean, 
make a long story short, it's that I feel pleasure and pain in this body and not anywhere else. Um, Um, that's why actually in the sixth meditation, when Descartes is trying to prove that his soul's union with his, his body is not like just the relationship of an angel to a body, um, that, in, that in some strong sense, the bo a certain body is his body. He says, like, if I were like that angel, um, then when something damaged that body, I would know that something had damaged that body. And then I could use that to decide what to do. But, um, but in real life, when something damages that body, I feel pain and it inclines my will, right? That's the sense in which I'm in that body. So, um, right, a being with a of the private interests is a being in space. And um, and it's important for what ethics wants for this to determine this. I mean, like, uh, suppose the thesis of the third antinomy, which we thought was the good side for ethics, suppose the thesis got its way, right? And said, well, why am I free to act? Here's me. Why am I free to act? Well, um, I can make a transition from not A to A. And nothing at all conditions that will happen. Well, you know, what makes it the case that I did this? Um, I just have left my audience, but okay, I'll keep going. So, what makes it the case that I did this? It's not anything about my own previous states. So, I mean, I have to draw my own previous states here, right? I create substance, I'm always the same. But I changed from one state to another. So if it was some something about my own previous states, in virtue of this, I made this happen, then it wouldn't be free. In the way that, that the thesis wants it to be. Or I guess put it differently. If, if for the thesis to be right, the second analogy would have to be wrong. If the second analogy is wrong, then um, you can't apply the concept of cause and effect to experience. This is the only way that we can apply it. So this picture is the only way we can apply it. So, um, the thesis is right, then there's this change here, all right. But there's no sense asking what's the cause of it. 
That is, if the second analogy were wrong, then Hume would be right. The application of the concept of cause would be illegitimate. And so the concept of action would be illegitimate. Right, and I mean, in fact, that actually the exact case, like spot where Hume has to train his argument against Locke. Right, that is Locke says that we observe the concept of cause and effect in the case of our own will, right, causing our own ideas or the motions of our body. And Hume says, no, you know, we, like, we observe this change from, like, I observe before the change from not A to A, I observe another change in myself from no will to do A to will to do A. So these things follow each other, but there's no necessary connection between them. Hume says, we can't perceive a necessary connection. And so, uh, like, I don't here have an application of the concept of cause and effect, legitimate application of it, any better than I do in the case of two external events. Right. So the point is, like, if it weren't for the second analogy, then my sensible will, which is the one that responds to pleasure and pain in this body, in time, in the world, right, um, could be regarded as the cause of any sensible effects. So um, there would be nothing for ethics to be about. So from the practical point of view, um, we need the determinism of the natural world to make ethics work. Um, and yet, on the other hand, it's also true from the practical point of view that I have to be able to regard myself as um, able to act against this interest, no matter how strong it is. Um, so I have to, in some sense, be able to regard this act as my free effects, not conditioned by anything else. So, like, in the theoretical case, the interest is going to get something substantial, and the thesis is going to get very little. But from the practical point of view, that's where they're both going to get what they really wanted. And I think that's what the judge is thinking of when the judge restates the claims of the two sides, right? Because in the uh, from the practical point of view, the judge is going to say, um, uh, antithesis, you were right. That every event in the series of experiences is completely determined by some cause that preceded it in time. Um, and on the other hand, thesis, you were right. Certain events are free effects of some of the objects of experience regarded from another point of view. So that's the solution. <laughs> that's the sense in which they're both right. From a practical point of view, they're both right in a relatively strong sense. It's true that there's a free cause. In particular, it's true that I'm a free cause. And yet, it's also true that I am a natural and necessary cause. And it's by putting those two things together that we can get the idea of moral laws 
applying to act real actions in the world, possibly against whatever it is that I happen to want. Um, So how are these things going to go together? I think um, um, it's important, like to understand it right, it's important to understand um, several things about this solution. So, I mean, Right, so the solution is there is absolute freedom that is there is a cause that produces an effect which was not conditioned by anything else to produce that effect. It's purely spontaneous. And determinism is true. That is, nothing happens in the world that wasn't determined to happen exactly in that way by some previous cause. So the first thing to understand about like, I mean, in a way, I think, like, I've already said these things, but now I'm, I'm trying to separate them out and get you to pay attention to them so that you can see how, like, Kant can think that this, this works. And by the way, I should emphasize all oh, this is from a practical point of view, right? From the theoretical point of view, we didn't reach this conclusion. There is absolute freedom. We didn't even reach the conclusion that absolute freedom is possible from the theoretical point of view. All we, the only conclusion we reached from a theoretical point of view is absolute freedom is not logically contradictory, right? But, um, but from the practical point of view, we reached this conclusion there is absolute freedom and determinism is true. So the first thing to understand about this is that this absolute freedom is not something that happens in time. Right, time is a form of inner sense. So anything that happens in time is a phenomenon. So like, let's say that at time T1, I move my arm like this. Now, I mean, this is determined by other, like every event, by other things that preceded it in time. So let's say, for example, that at time T0, I felt like moving my arm. <laughs> and given, I mean, it's always going to be. Like, this is really what the third analogy establishes. It's always going to be um, like uh, a, due to an indefinite context of other factors, right? That, that, that this event is, is determined, right? So I felt like moving my arm, and, you know, like nothing came in between and chopped my arm off or paralyzed me, and I didn't change my mind because I suddenly got distracted and. Right, like all kinds of stuff has to happen, but, but it's all going to be stuff like this. For example, I feel like moving my arm. If you put all that together, this had to happen. Nothing else could have happened. So, um, if I said, oh, but I'm also free to move my arm, absolutely free. None of this stuff can make a difference. 
then that seems like a contradiction. He's like, when did I make the free decision to move my arm? Like, let's say this is when I felt like moving my arm, and this time here in between is when I freely decide. So that means that like no matter what happens before this, after this, I could have moved my arm or not moved. This wasn't conditioned by anything else that happened before this. But that's impossible because we know that this things that happened before already made it necessary. So this, it seems like you can't maintain both of these things. There is absolute freedom and determinism is true. But the problem with this picture is that it's not true that my free causation happens at a certain time. Right? When I regard myself as an absolutely free cause, I'm thinking of myself as a noumenon, as not in time. So there's no saying when I reach the free cause to move my arm. It's outside of the time scheme. It's not really a decision. Right, a decision is something that happens at a time. You go from a state of uncertainty to a state of certainty or something. Call this the free causality. Comes in from a different direction, so to speak. And so, I mean, this still isn't the right way to say it, but you can say, you know, I already decided way back here. I had always decided to move my arm. I mean, the reason it's not still not the right way to say it is that this isn't in time at all, right? It isn't back here and it isn't over here. It's just like um, conditions of time don't apply to it. But still, it's true that it's, you know, like happened at this time as much as it happened at this time or any other time. So, like, before this ever happened, I had already made my decision, so to speak. Before anything ever happened, I had already made my decision. If I had made some other decision, then different things would have happened. Um, and they would have led to a different result here. So that was the first thing I wanted to say. So the second thing kind of fits into this. So, I mean, re remember, we're saying that the same thing is both the phenomenal or empirical cause of this event and the human or free cause event. So, I mean, first of all, when you, the, remember, the same thing is not the event that happened here. I feel like moving my arm. This is the causality of the empirical cause. So actually, maybe uh, God is in here. So this is me. Here I am regarded as a human being. Um, Here I am regarded as a phenomenon. So 
you can't draw this. I mean, like you obviously can't draw it, right? Because I'm trying to re to re represent the relationship between something viewed as in time and space and as not in time and space. So there's no room in space to draw that. Um, so, uh, right, I mean, um, but still, like, so look at it this way. These things are both the same. This, from this side, it looks like this. And from this other side, it looks like this. Well, that is, it has a series of states. So, um, So it's right, it's not the states that cause each other. It's the substance under the influence of other substances that changes from one state to another. Um, sometimes it could be under its own influence. Um, in fact, I think it's always partly under its own influence. So I didn't draw this in this picture, but sometimes. The fact that A itself changed from one state to another can be part of what determines it to make a further change. Um, um, but of course, uh, um, that's never a complete explanation. Right, you have to take it back another step and say, well, okay, but why did it do that? And that could also be its own change of state. But I think, again, so we didn't read the third analogy, but the third analogy proves that all the substances in the world are in reciprocal causal relations to each other. So like part of the explanation of this is always gonna be other substances and part of it is gonna be this substance. So, um, this substance itself is always the same, but due to its own previous states and to the other substance around it, it's changing from one thing to another, from one state to another. The rule, um, the rule according to which it changes from one state to another is, what Kant called its empirical character. Oh, here we go. So Kant defines character on B five sixty seven. So, I mean, by the way, I guess we could say the fact that the cause is the substance is um, what makes what I was saying just here at all plausible. Right? Like if I said this event, this change from one thing to another, can also be looked at as a numinal object um, that's not in time at all. That wouldn't make any sense. An event by definition is changed in time from one thing to another. Um, um, but if you tried to think of that that way, you would start thinking that that idea that you know this event, which is determined by other natural causes, 
is also a free decision that happens at this very time here. Right? That that's not right. There is no free decision as an event that happens in time. And that makes sense because when I say that I'm the empirical cause of my own movement, um, I mean I regard it as a permanent substance and the empirical cause of my own movement. Um, so it's due to what's constant in time about me. If this event happens, it's constant. And that's why like, it even makes sense at all to say, but I could also think of myself as not in time and as causing it from now on. All right, if you didn't follow that, um, well, if that was the first thing you didn't follow, you're in good shape. But anyway, if you didn't follow that, don't worry about it. So getting back to this, right? So here's a B560. Uh, seven. Kant says what he means by character. Every efficient cause must have a character, that is, a law of its causality, without which it would not be a cause. Right, I mean, if there wasn't some constant character, this is the, this is why a, a cause has to be a substance, basically. If there wasn't some constant character here, then um, you could say it's because of the same thing that this happened and then this happened. Not, not, not really All right, so um, so like there's something constant about this substance such that it always it has a certain series of effects given what all the other substances are doing. So like I mean uh, I think that's true of any substance or you know but I think. Kant is one reason he's choosing the term character here is that in the case of the human being in particular, this does kind of partly correspond to what we call someone's character, right? So when you talk about someone's character, you know, you mean, of course, like their character isn't a list of all the things they're going to do. You can't even derive from it a list of all the things they're going to do. But, um, but it is like a law according to which they react to circumstances. And insofar as they can see you the same person, that stays the same. Or it changes in a regular way, but then that regular way is what we really want to call the character. Right? The thing that stays the same about them. So regarded as a phenomenon, I have an empirical character. And the empirical character, together with my circumstances, determines what I'm going to do. And there isn't, there can't be anything ultimately mysterious about this, right? I mean, it ultimately has to be something that you can understand by looking inside my body. Probably especially my brain, but not only my brain. You know, but in any case, by looking inside my body, you have to um, be able to understand why it reacts in a certain way to external causes and has certain effects and so forth. Um, that's the only way from the theoretical point of view we can understand cause and effect at all. So the empirical character is not like inexplicable, but it's, you know, I mean, it's nevertheless, it's a feature of me, and, and if you know it, you can predict what I'm going to do in every situation. On the other hand, regarded as a noonal case, it 
I have to be thought, oops, I have to be thought of myself, think of myself as having an intelligible self. What is that? Well, you know, um, it's the law that determines what all my effects will be. But now, like, it's not a law that, you know, um, like, explains my, all, what my, my effects will be by saying how I react to circumstances and so on and so forth. It's a kind of principle from which all these effects can be deduced. What kind of principle could that be? Well, like in, in a certain sense, we don't know, like from a um, theoretical point of view, we don't understand what a principle like that would be. But from a practical point of view, we can understand what a principle like that would be. Um, it would be what Kant calls a maxim, that is a rule for determining your will. Um, and um, solution here is like how can we regard the intelligible character the, the how can we regard me as a noumenon and a free cause of the very same things that as a phenomenon and the natural cause and the answer is that we have to think of the empirical character as caused by the intelligible character So again, like, the intelligible character doesn't kind of like go along step by step with the empirical character and make free decisions at the same time as the empirical character is making necessary decisions. The intelligible character, so to speak, has chosen the entire empirical character all at once. Not based on anything. Um, and, you know, it's so it's necessary to say this from this in this way of solving the problem. Um, This intelligible character has chosen differently, so to speak. But of course, like, um, it didn't choose at some time. <laughs> you know, but if it had, so to speak, chosen differently, then um, um, The law of nature would be different. The empirical character would be different. I would react in a different way to events than I actually react. It would still be perfectly possible in this other scenario to predict all of my actions by studying my empirical character. And there would be no exceptions to the law of causality. Um, so uh, no matter which way the intelligible character chooses, so to speak, there's no uh, violation of the law of causality, which is uh, apparent. 
Um, but nevertheless, the, the thinking of the causation is going this way. So we're thinking of um, um, we're not thinking of this as conditioning this, but only the other way around. So it's necessary to think of it this way. It's weird to think of it this way. But on the other hand, Kant um, sees like sees this as something that people before him were thinking both uh, in the sense that there's this Christian doctrine of election that you know the the people who will be saved have like it's already been determined who's going to be saved <laughs> because like God knows the future, right? So, um, so there's different interpretations of this view. Um, when Kant is providing his interpretation of it, that like, um, if I'm going to be a moral person, I, so to speak, already decided that I'm not deciding it now. But I think this is also his interpretation of the passage in Plato's Republic. Um, where part of the so-called myth of error, which is what he calls that, um, that, um, um, that like before we're born, we choose what our life is going to be. Um, so like both in the like religious tradition and the philosophical tradition, that Kant is trying to inherit and interpret to find things that, that finds that freedom is already understood this way. Um, I mean that is in this case you have to look at that if this is a symbolic representation, right? Like as if there were a time before I was born when I was floating up in the world of forms and I made this decision. But uh, um, but it's Pretty reasonable, if not absolutely necessary, to interpret all the things like that that Plato says in, in a, some kind of symbolic way like this. Um, okay. There are a lot more things I could have said here. I wanted to say more about the difference between the mathematical categories and the dynamic categories. I wanted to say more about why from a practical point of view we um, are able to regard ourselves or forced to regard ourselves as human enough. Um, it's like it's basically because the will is its own object as such. This is what Kant means in the practical philosophy when he says the will is an end in itself. Right? This is the same, this in itself is the same ends in the same some thing in itself. So like when we insofar as we're objects of our own will, we are things in themselves. <laughs> That's that's basically how this works, but obviously I don't have time to say anything more about it. Um, um, but I do hope at least like you get you got some feeling of what the solution to the good antinomy is and how Kant thinks it it makes um, it possible from a practical point of view to reconcile freedom and determinism. Okay. Uh, I hope you have a good Thanksgiving if you're watching this video before Thanksgiving and and oh, I'm still recording. Uh, I will see you next week, I hope. Bye.